I'm Sarah Wilson and you're listening to the Roots and All podcast. I'm here to help you get growing. Join me as I explore everything plant related both indoors and out and provide the information you need to create your perfect green environment. Hello and welcome to this week's episode where I'm talking to Anna Soper, a Canadian artist, writer, podcaster and master of too many things to mention really, about Kate Crooks, a largely forgotten Canadian botanist, whose work Anna uncovered for a project she undertook in 2018. Anna's research into Kate Crooks has unearthed pieces of a historical jigsaw puzzle, which leave us wondering how many other botanists and specimens are out there, just waiting to be discovered, and how many of these important pieces of the botanical record have been lost forever. I start by asking Anna how she came upon Kate's work. Uh, well, I have a Bachelor of Fine Arts degree. Uh, that that was my first degree. And so, although I'm working as a librarian now, I've been practicing as an artist for many years. And I was working on an art exhibition in uh, 2018. Um, and that was an exhibition of temporary public art for the city of Kingston. And this piece was based on some research that I started in 2017. 2017 was the 150th anniversary of Canadian Confederation. And um, a lot of people that year were commemorating the anniversary in different ways. There were obviously official celebrations, but then there were also people who were just doing things like trying to read as many Canadian books in a year as they could. Um, There were some people who were traveling to iconic Canadian sites, heritage sites across Canada. And so I thought it would be cool to do a flora of Kingston, which is where I live, and just uh, observing all the plants that I uh, that I would pass by on my way to work, or things that were growing in my neighborhood, or wildflowers in a park. And um, I thought it would be interesting if I could find a historical precedent. And um, I did a bit of research on the Internet Archive, and I found um, the annals of the Botanical Society of Canada which uh, I had not heard of before, but they were founded in Kingston um, in 1859, I think. And um, they were a very active group here in in this city at Queen's University um, and and seemed to have flourished for a very short period of time uh, before before ultimately folding in the early 1860s. Um, But in the annals, there is a flora of Kingston uh, which was compiled around 1858 and 1859. And I, I thought that that was a great resource because I was actually able to find some of the same plants in similar locations um, that had been recorded here um, at that time. But as I was flipping through the annals, I also found a flora of Hamilton, which is a city west of Toronto. And I found several references in this flora to a Miss Crooks. And I was intrigued. I thought, oh, who is this person? So I started doing a bit more searching, and I discovered that she was called Kate Crooks. And I I realized that she was actually, she had compiled a a quite rigorous flora of of parts of southwestern Ontario. And I wondered why I'd never heard about her before. I wondered why she was not as well-known as as someone like Catherine Parr Trail, who's an incredibly well-known historical figure in, in Canada. She was a, a naturalist and a writer, um, published lots of books about the Canadian flora. And I, I just thought, oh, well, well, who is this person? Who is Kate Crook? And so when I was producing this artwork for the city of Kingston the following year, I, I dug a little deeper into Kate Crook's story and the story of the Botanical Society of Canada. Um, and uh, and really folded her story and their story into that that piece of art. And a lot of Canadians live in southern Ontario, which is the region in which Kate Crooks worked. And so we have a very densely built up urban and suburban and industrial um, uh, land use here in, in Ontario. So Kate Crooks' work is really important because she created a record of the Ontario flora Um, before industrialization really ramped up in Ontario. And so her her, her specimen collections kind of shine a light on a lot of of rare plants now. 
Um, most of the plants that she recorded are plants that I was not familiar with. And I've grown up in Ontario. I've lived here for most of my life. And so um, there is something kind of poignant about the fact that she was gathering this information just before um, a lot of these wild spaces were changed forever. And what are the chances of having found somebody who had done a similar project to what you were doing? You know, as you say, there were other people doing it. It's just that you found Kate, who was a woman and who had covered your region. But had you been living in another part of Canada, do you think you would have found a similar document? In Canada... Um, we don't have as long a history, um, you know, quote unquote history. Obviously, we have a very long history of, of, of settlement here in, in, this, in this part of the world. But in terms of that sort of the European canon of, of naming and recording, we don't have as, as deep a history as the United Kingdom has. And so um, I, I, I guess I... I feel like there would be lots of British flora. Sometimes I think if I lived in the UK, I could probably find a flora of some small parish or some part of London and go and investigate and see whether the same plants are growing there or, or what new plants are growing there. Um, in Canada, we, we have, um, we have had more of a patchwork, um, uh, network, uh, which is actually one of the things that's sort of surprising about the Botanical Society in Canada, because um, it was it was it was one of the first societies of its kind in this country, and it created one of Canada's first botanical gardens. And yet, no one in Kingston, which is a city that values its history immensely, we're actually the first capital of Canada. No one in Kingston knows about the Botanical Society of Canada. So you really did unearth a treasure. Um, yeah, I think so. Yeah. So what was Kate's kind of, just briefly, what was her background? What was her early life like and, and how did she get into documenting the flora? Mm-hmm. There's not too much that's known about her, uh, which is sad and, and troubling. Um, but I, I have been able to piece together a narrative. Um, So she was born in what is now Niagara-on-the-Lake, which is about a half an hour drive north of Niagara Falls. Um, She was uh, the daughter of a Scottish immigrant. She had a very large, extended Scottish-Canadian family here. Um, And her mother was uh, the daughter of United Empire Loyalists. They, They were people who left the United States during the American Revolution, who decided that they would rather be um, loyal to the crown. And so they came to Canada, which at the time was British North America. Uh, so she was a first generation Canadian. She, she's what we would call a first generation Canadian. Um, but she had a, a very difficult early life. Uh, her father died of scarlet fever just a few weeks after her birth. Um, and uh, she, it, it, there is a record that indicates that she was baptized on the very same day as her father's funeral. Um, she um, grew up in a, in a household that was lacking um, a, a paternal figure, which at the time was, was a, very, um, a very big barrier uh, to, to their development as a family. She had older sisters, so they actually founded a, a school for girls in their home. And um, their mom was in failing health pretty much for the rest of, of her life. So uh, I think that as the youngest of, of all of her sisters, she probably, she was probably somewhat raised by them. I wonder if having a slightly more tough upbringing led her to, to do what she did later in life. Yeah, sometimes I wonder whether it was some kind of therapy or healing for her just to spend time in, in nature and, and to be present and, and notice and record what she was seeing. And it must have been, obviously, uh, the Victorian era was... Um, it was a time when women were encouraged to do things like that, sort of go out into the nature and collect things and create little crafts and doodads with your, with your findings. But she was actually engaging in, I think, a more rigorous scientific process than, than many other women might have at that time um, because she created a uh, herbarium um, that, um, that was up to the standard of the kind that, that men were creating in that era. Mm. And did she receive any formal training? I don't know too much about her her education. Um, I do know that 
around the time when she started her, her practice, or, or shortly before she started her practice, there was a very young scientist in Montreal who published a book for the layperson. And that book, it was just a pamphlet, really. And it describes how to, um, how to gather and prepare specimens for herbarium. And I, I, I wonder whether she might have referred to that book at, at some point. And certainly the fact that she joined the Botanical Society of Canada would have given her a good framework uh, to connect with people um, uh, who, who might have helped her, uh, taught her about uh, some of these principles. Would she have been in the minority in the Botanical Society as a woman? Do you know that? There were a few other, they called them lady members. Um, and um, she would have been in the minority, yes. Um, but there were a few other women. She was one of the first women to join. Right. So her work was was obviously had scientific merit. Do you know how it was received at the time by her contemporaries? Yeah, it, it, she seems to have been quite well respected. Um, there are uh, a few references to her work over the years, um, both during her life and after uh, her death. Um, and I'll just pull up a, a couple of lines here I can quote. So she she had a collaborator. Her, her brother-in-law was Alexander Logie. He was a judge in the Hamilton area. Um, and um, after... Uh, his death, because he he also uh, did not did not have a very long life. Uh, there was a, a man called John Milne Buchan, um, who I don't believe is any relation to the author, but um, he described himself as Logie's botanical executor. And I have to wonder whether um, some of Crook's specimens might have ended up in that collection. Um, because Buchan actually described Kate Crooks' uh, uh, work um, at the same time as, as he was describing um, Logie's collection and, and the merits of Logie's collection. So he said that um, he has uh, examined the extensive collection made by the late Mrs. Smart, which is Kate Crooks, uh, sister-in-law of Judge Logie, and a most enthusiastic botanist. And he wrote that there are some and probably a good many plants not included uh, in the list uh, that, that Logie had prepared. So there's a sort of a, a tantalizing hint of, of, of Crooks's uh, work throughout a number of these references, um, and, and, and which is why it's, it's disappointing that it doesn't seem uh, that, that many of them have survived. But, but Buchan also said, if at some future period I should have the time and the opportunity to examine her collection, he said he, he might be able to increase the list of plants that, that, uh, that Logie had, had compiled of that area. So I don't know whether Buchan ever had the chance to look at her specimens. I haven't been able to find a follow-up to that. Um, and it, and so that is it's disappointing. Just there are these little tidbits, and then you, you just want to know what happened next. Um, but she she exhibited her work in Toronto in 1866, and um, this was reviewed in a trade publication called the Canada Farmer, and they wrote that um, they said Mrs. Smart of Yorkville, which is in Toronto displayed in the picture gallery by some mistake a very good collection of dried native plants. And they wrote it was impossible to look through the whole of it, which suggests a very large collection. But they said in our brief examination, we discovered some rare varieties which would gladden the heart of a botanist. Hmm. So she was obviously out yeah. botanizing extensively. Um, would she have done this while, during her married life or... Would this have been something that she just did, that she took up kind of fairly early on and just continued to do? And would she have been paid for it? Yeah, the last record that I have of, of her uh, actually collecting specimens is just before she married in 1865. So there's a specimen in Montreal at McGill University, um, and that was collected in July 1865 in Hamilton. She actually married on July 3rd. 
1865. Um, and that, that specimen is attributed to a Miss Crooks. So that suggests that she collected it just before her, her wedding day. There's a part of me that, that sort of likes to imagine that maybe she took a, a piece of, of, of that uh, specimen from, from her wedding bouquet or, or something, sort of romantic like that. Um, but she did exhibit after her, her marriage because uh, that exhibition at the uh, Provincial Agricultural Fair in 1866 in Toronto, she was pregnant at the time. She gave birth to her first child three weeks after the agricultural exhibition. So it does suggest that, that she was able to continue to work even after she married. Sorry, I asked two questions in one then. Uh, but the second part of it was, do you think she would have been paid for her work or would it have been a hobby? She won prizes for her work. So so it, she wasn't paid um, in, in sort of the traditional way, but, but she, she did, as part of these exhibitions that she, that she participated in, she did win cash prizes. Presumably not enough to get by on or I'm guessing there must have been an income from somewhere. Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, in the, the earlier years, uh, I I know that she lived with her sister, uh, her sisters and, and brothers-in-law. Uh, she she seems to have moved around to various addresses in southwestern Ontario. Uh, so she would have been supported uh, in that sense. Um, her 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 brother-in-law was uh, a judge, uh, and uh, her, her husband was a lawyer. So I think that she was probably comfortable during her life. She also received money from her mother's estate, and this was part of a dispute that occurred after her death. Um, three of her surviving sisters sued her her husband um, and and her young children. Um, because they disputed the fact that she had received money from from her mom's estate, which was her will was written up before Kate Crooks married. So at the time, she would have needed her mom's estate, and so her sisters were upset that she had um, that she had taken in this money even after she got married. Hmm. So when you were researching her, were there any specimens that you came across that you thought? gladdened your heart as they put it in the review well just this one specimen seems to have survived the one that sits in montreal um and that is that specimen is very interesting because it's um it's a plant that that no longer exists in the wild in ontario so it's it's uh it's conservation status overall is secure but it's extinct in this province, and it's considered threatened in New York State. So its range has been pushed further and further south into the United States. Um, and so that plant is, is, is no longer found here, uh, and that specimen is, is believed to be the only specimen from Ontario of, of that plant from the wild. So that's a very important specimen. And when I was in touch with the curator of that herbarium at McGill University, one of the things she told me was that um, it's very important. It would be great to find her specimen collection um, because you can do a lot more science with physical specimens than you can with just recorded observations in a list or a flora. Because with specimens, you can actually extract DNA. So you can get a lot more information from physical specimens. So it would be great to find more of her specimens because then that would actually open up some some, uh, some new avenues for scientific research. Mm, yeah. Oh, you do have to wonder what happened to them. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's so many possibilities. There are, there are lots of possibilities because, I mean, if, for example, if she donated all of her specimens to that one collection, well, in its earlier incarnation, they actually had a flood. Um, and so uh, there, there are records of, of lost specimens. Uh, as part of, of what became the McGill University Herbarium. Um, uh, but I also wonder whether may- maybe she traded some specimens uh, with uh, Kew or Harvard because uh, uh, both Asa Gray from Harvard and Sir William Jackson Hooker of Kew were corresponding members of the Botanical Society of Canada. Um, but I've been in touch with a number of herbarium curators around the world, and the biggest barrier they tell me is just the human resources, the labor that it would take 
to describe all of their holdings. I had curators tell me, you know, we have 20,000 specimens that we don't have any records of. They exist. They're here in our building, in our facility, but they're not actually cataloged or databased. And so that's a huge barrier. If you can't um, do a search through your collection, um, you, you don't really know what you have. So it's sort of like a needle in a haystack. It's possible that there are more specimens that crooks prepared that, that have survived, um, but it's just a, a matter of, of time, maybe, mm. um, and, and a lot of work. <laughs> and as a librarian, I sympathize, because I understand it's very hard to digitize stuff. It takes a long time to catalog things, and, and you need a lot of, you need time and you need money uh, to do that kind of work. Um, and, and also, I've had some curators tell me, well, we're cataloging our, our, our backlog, but we're just capturing the name of the plant and where it was collected. So if they're not also capturing other metadata like the collector, then you know the, there's kind of there's a barrier in that sense. So there's an information barrier here that's, that's really part of the problem. Yeah, it's such a shame. I just finished reading a book called Murder Most Florid, which is about somebody, a forensic botanist. And he was saying that the resources that we have here in the UK are just shrinking because there aren't the funds available to manage the collection. So I can't see it changing anytime soon, which is which is a real shame. Because as you say, there's probably loads yeah. of unearthed treasures lurking in there. I think that's a good point. So that would, I suppose, explain why her work disappeared. It just well, as you say, it could have been fire, flood or act of God, but it might also be the fact that it just, you know, got lost in the midst of other things. Yes, absolutely. Yes, yeah, it is a shame. After she died, nobody presumably then was speaking about her work. She, You know, was anyone kind of remembering what she did? Is that how she her work just pretty much disappeared until you found her? Mm. There are a couple of references. Um, there is the reference from from John Buchan, who was um, her uh, brother-in-law's botanical executor, which I, I love that phrase that he, that he coined for himself. Um, and so, yeah, he described her, her collection and said he, he hoped to look at it someday. And I don't have any information as to whether he did actually look at it. Um, there is a, another reference in... Um, the Hamilton Association, um, they were a, they are a, a science and, um, uh, and literature kind of, uh, association in Hamilton, Ontario. And so, um, during the, let me just look at, I believe it was the inaugural address. Yeah, during the inaugural address, uh, which was delivered in Hamilton, Ontario in 1898, um, the president of the Hamilton Association uh, referenced Logie's collection. So he said, I would also remind our botanical members of the fact that Judge Logie received much assistance from his sister-in-law, Miss Kate Crooks, when preparing his valuable list of Hamilton flora. And so Logie's collection at that point was actually acquired by the Hamilton Association. And that's the last reference that I have found of his specimens uh, being in one place. Um, and I was in touch with the Hamilton Association a couple of years ago, and they told me that at some point, a number of their collections were dispersed to the Royal Botanical Gardens here in Ontario, uh, the Royal Ontario Museum in Toronto, and um, uh, some other universities in Ontario. So uh, there seems to be sort of a scattering of, of both Logies and perhaps Crook specimens. Um, but Crooks was also cited in the Geological Survey of Canada. Um, there was a, um, um, a publication, uh, a, a sort of a directory of Canadian plants that was produced as part of the Geological Survey of Canada beginning in, in 1882. And so the, the Dominion botanist, which was his title, he was called John McCoon, and he was uh, a former member of the Botanical Society of Canada. So he actually cited Kate Crooks's records um, in in his list of, of Canadian plants. So even after her death, there was an acknowledgement that her work was significant. It just seems like since maybe 1900, there was perhaps uh, as people died who who knew her, um, there was just a sort of a, a forgetting of of her legacy. It's such a jigsaw puzzle. There's so many pieces that that are possibly out there. Um... 
if obviously you you've done your research if people wanted to find more find out more or try and find out more can you suggest anywhere they might go and have a look um i um i i there isn't much that's been written about her. I know that there is someone uh, who is writing a chapter about her. I, I don't know when that will be published. Uh, my article for Atlas Obscura is, I believe, the first story about Kate Crookson's life and work. Um, so that is available. Uh, I'll send you the links to that. Um, I guess if, if anyone's interested in, in the history of Canadian botany, there are some resources online. Um, and Catherine Parr Trail's book, uh, and well, a number of her books, but her her seminal book, which was published in 1868, is called Canadian Wildflowers. That book is available on the Internet Archive, uh, I believe, through the Biodiversity Heritage Library. And actually, the Biodiversity Heritage Library has been a great resource for me. That's uh, an online library, um, and they have the annals of the Botanical Society of Canada in association with the Internet Archive. And that was what led me to uh, to discover Kate Crooks' story. Well, well done on uncovering it um, so far. It's a fascinating find. And, you know, mm. and, and there must be so many more out there like it. I would encourage people to kind of go and do some digging, especially if the stuff's available online. It makes it much more accessible. Um, I can't let you go without mentioning your podcast because you are a fellow podcaster and I know it's not um, related <laughs> to gardening, but would you like to just mention, give it a mention? Thank you. I'd, I'd love to mention it. It's not related to gardening at all. And it's actually, it's funny because um, it's so unlike anything I've ever done because as an artist uh, and as, uh, as someone interested in history, I'm very interested in environmental history and working with archive collections. And so this podcast is completely pop cultural. Um, I catch up with people who were in Teen People magazine as young adults. Um, and this is based on my childhood. A collection of teen people, which I, I saved. <laughs> Somehow I saved about a dozen of them from my subscription. Um, teen People was published between 1998 and 2006. And so like its parent publication, it, it did things like Sexiest People and Best Dressed List, but it also had stories of ordinary people. Um, and so when I bought my first house a couple of years ago, I was flipping through some of these magazines, which I found in a box from my dad's house. And um, uh, and I thought, oh, wouldn't it be fascinating to contact all of these ordinary people? And because and, their names and, and, and ages and cities were listed in teen people. Um, and so it, it's taken me a couple of years to realize that I could just turn it into a podcast. I think in some ways the lockdown actually um, inspired this project as a podcast. I'm not a podcaster. I, this is my first attempt. Um, but it's been really gratifying to just reach out to these people and to hear their stories, to hear their memories of, of being in Teen People magazine, but also really to get a sense of how they're doing because most of my guests are American. And so this is a very, very troubled time for, for America in so many ways. And uh, so it's been fascinating to hear a sort of millennial and Gen X perspective of what's going on in America today. Thank you, Anna, for discovering and sharing Kate's work and for the interview. And thanks for the Teen People podcast, which, as if you needed another reminder, is a great example of podcasting recording the important cultural events and often unheard stories in a format that is hopefully, although not certainly, more enduring than a pressed botanical specimen. If you're interested in female botanists who were working at a time when botany was largely the preserve of men, I can recommend episode 45, where I spoke to Terry Sayers-Cooper and Tanya Latti about the work of Marianne North and Maria Sibylla Merrion. Thanks to you for listening. Here's Dr Ian Bedford talking about bugs that I'm fairly sure are universally unliked unless you run a tiny circus. If there's one insect that we really don't want to find in our homes, it's the flea. Fleas are ectoparasites and one of only a few insects that need to feed on the blood of others for all of its life. Although there's many different species of flea in the UK, it's usually cat and dog fleas that are the most common and cause us the most problems. These fleas are brought into our homes on our pets after hitching a ride on their coats. Cat fleas are likely to have been waiting dormant around the garden, 
particularly in secluded dry places where cats like to go for a daytime nap, whilst dog fleas can usually be found lurking in the lawn. As soon as a flea detects its victim, it becomes alert before making a perfectly timed leap up to 200 times its body length onto the animal's fur. Once aboard, they quickly find a suitable site to feed from and excrete an enzyme to soften the skin. Their specially adapted mouth parts enable them to pierce a hole within the skin and then insert a needle-like stylet into a blood capillary. The pressure within the capillary then forces the blood into the flea's stomach. During each feed, the flea imbibes much more blood than it actually needs, so this is excreted as tiny droplets that fall to the floor and dry into little dark coloured grains. Whilst the females feed, they also lay around 50 eggs a day, which, not being sticky, also fall off the host and onto the floor below. The eggs soon hatch into tiny, pale-coloured maggots, which begin feeding on the grains of dried blood and develop into new adult fleas over the following two to three months. Eradicating fleas from a home can be tricky, since fleas are very well adapted to survive and can live for many months without feeding often remaining motionless for up to a hundred days at a time. Grooming pets regularly, and if possible, washing them with a good pet shampoo, will certainly help to reduce infestations, as will treating them with a proprietary insecticide. But don't forget that for every flea that is on a pet, there could be up to a hundred others elsewhere in the house. So, a regular vacuum, especially under furniture, around carpet edges and in pet baskets will also be needed. You can download or listen to the podcast direct from the website www.rootsandall.co.uk where you'll also find my blog and a sign-up form for the newsletter which gives you a weekly roundup of content plus the inside scoop on things like upcoming guests. Or you can subscribe wherever you normally get your podcasts. Email me with comments and feedback at podcast at rootsandall.co.uk. Follow me on Twitter, Roots and All, Facebook, Roots and All UK, and Instagram, Roots and All Pod. But please also check out my Patreon, where you can make a one-off donation or take out a monthly subscription to help support my work, because if you like what I do, please help me to continue doing it. Even if you make a one-off donation of a pound, trust me, it all helps, and I will be immensely grateful. So please go to Patreon and search for Roots and All.